And so the pregame ceremonies and festivities are over. And Ozzie Smith with a little added twist there. Not simply a flip, but something right out of the Bella Caroli school. As you look at the Twins lineup, Dan Gladden leading off and Gagne at short. Kirby Bucket batting third. Gary Gaetti having a great postseason in the cleanup spot. Brunanski hitting fifth and Herbeck sixth in the order. Tim Wadner does the catching. Lombard Doji hits in the eighth spot. And the pitcher is Les Straker. Now defensively for the St. Louis Cardinals in the outfield, Coleman McGee and Kurt Ford. The infield, Okendo at third. Smith, Kerr, and Dreesen plays first base tonight against the right-hander. Pena back of the plate. And on the mound for the St. Louis Cardinals is John Tudor with a mark of 10 and 2. And of course, we have been showing you our regular feature prior to each game. Tony Gwynn of the San Diego Padres, who knows a little bit about hitting and a little bit about the pitchers in this league. Here's Tony assessing John Tudor. John Tudor's real deliberate. So it appears that he, he's overpowering, but I think it's his windup that really lulls you to sleep. Uh, he's got great composure on the mound. Nothing ever rattles him. And when he's on, he's really tough to hit. You can't go up there and sit on one pitch. You've got to go up there and just try to get your bat on the ball. But if he doesn't have his good stuff, then he has a tendency to be wild high. But I think the reason why he's been so effective is the development of his changeup. And he had that really working the other night against San Francisco. Greg Kosk is an American League umpire, so he hasn't seen, well, he hasn't seen Tudor in a while anyway. John used to pitch with the Red Sox. John McSherry at first, Ken Kaiser at second, then Terry Tata at third with Dave Phillips down the line and left and Lee Wire in right. Now here in Bush Stadium, a ballpark that would be quite dissimilar to the Metrodome in as much as not that many runs are scored here and certainly far fewer homers are hit here. 330 down the lines and a vast 383 to the alleys and 414 to straightaway center and as close to being a pitcher's park really outside of the Astrodome as any park in the National League. Meanwhile, picking up from where he left off on Sunday, there is Whitey Herzog with Ken Kaiser before the game, and he was picking up that argument about Burt Blylevin. Well, he said he balked 11 times in the, in, in the entire game, three times in the first inning, and Kenny Kaiser was the umpire at third base, so he's the next umpire other than Lee Wire who's home plate to really call that balk even though anybody could. I don't think I've ever seen a manager argue with an umpire in a street close. That happened uh, about an hour before the game and what's amazing is that Whitey thinking ahead when Blylevin pitches again Kaiser could be back of the plate. So Whitey getting in some early action as Gladden starts by taking a strike and the count is 0-1. Gladden, Gagne and Puckett here in the first inning. Gladden with a grand slam home run in game one and three for nine in the first two games. And if you're going to throw one away, this is the most opportune time to do it. One and one. Timmy, so you never played for Earl Weaver. He used to catch him on the way home. He knew he never won any arguments inside the ballpark. <laughs> Not before the game at street close, but after the game at street well, close. All right. Tudor working on Gladden with Gagne to follow and the 1 1 pitch is lifted to right field and toward the line curling foul back out of play. And it's 1 and 2 on this very chilly night with temperatures in the mid 40s and the wind blowing at about 12 miles per hour and the temperature expected to drop to about 40 degrees. A well, very unusual year for John Tudor broke his leg on April 19th didn't get back till August 1st then went 10 and 1. In the air to right field and right to Ford who doesn't have a roof to worry about tonight one away. Second, number seven. Shortstop. Good background for the outfielders here. <laughs> yeah his roof tonight is a lot darker and much higher. <laughs> yeah. So one gone in the first inning and Greg Gagne comes to the plate. In this World Series, Gagne is 
one for nine so he is one of the few twins who really hasn't shared the wealth at least offensively. One out and the base is empty. Oh and one the count. Tony Gwynn talked about John Tudor and I think that you can get a pretty good idea if you're watching at home just by watching Tony Pena. When he moves and Tudor's on his game the ball is going to be very much in the location of his glove. Nothing very tricky basically to right handed hitters and I talked to him before the game nothing but fastballs and change ups. Good change there. So watch Pena and watch where he moves and then watch if Tudor gets the ball there. If he does he's going to be on. Change up away right on the corner right where Pena is sitting. Curve balls only to Kent Herbeck. He said he has not thrown more than two and three curve balls to right handed hitters in the last three years. He reaches out and lifts it to shallow right. Tommy Herr goes out. And there are two guys. So Tudor begins pretty much the way he began and ended against the Giants last week, working the outside part for the most part, getting them to lunge and reach. And he has retired the first two. We talked about the circle change thrown by Frank Viola in game one. Well, Tudor throws his change up quite a bit differently. As a matter of fact, he doesn't use his last three fingers. He uses the middle three fingers. It's almost a palm ball, and he throws his change ups with such varying speeds with the same arm motion as his fastball and that's the secret of having a good changeup. has nothing to do with the body speeding up but the same arm motion. Tudor working on Kirby Puckett with two out breaking pitch for a strike in the count of one one. And when you look at John Tudor 39 and 32 in the American League and he comes over here to the National League and he's 56 and 28 so he's 667 pitcher which is uh, might be the best winning percentage of all time for somebody that has as many decisions as he does outside some of the twins would be relatively familiar with Tudor John pitched with the Red Sox back in 1983 and before that he had first come up back in 79 so some of the twins have seen him in the past fouled back one and two. Take a look at his motion back in 1985 he was one in seven then won 20 out of the next 21 games and right there you see his right elbow hit his right knee and that is the key his high school battery mate after starting out one and seven called him and said hey you're not pitching the way you used to he went back to that motion and then rattled off 20 out of 21 wins 18 in a row at one point here in Bush Stadium. Grounded down to Tommy Herr. So a good beginning for the Cardinals in game three. Twins down in order after a half. Minnesota nothing. St. Louis coming up. Going to the bottom of the first inning now at Bush Stadium. And for the Cardinals tonight, Coleman, Smith, and Herr. The big three at the top. Two for 24. Then Drees in the cleanup hitter. McGee hits in the five spot. Ford sixth. Okendo batting seventh. Tony Pena does the catching and John Tudor the pitching. No designated hitter in the games in the National League Park. Unlike in Minnesota where each team could use the DH and will be able to if we go back there Saturday and Sunday. As far as the inside pitch is concerned on Les Straker, let's find out from the Milwaukee Brewers, Paul Molitor. The important factor for Les Straker being effective is getting through those first few innings. He has a tendency early in the ball game to give up big innings. Now what happens is he'll get a few runners on base and get a little bit flustered. Now as a hitter, the advantage will swing in your direction. If you can just be patient in these situations, eventually he's going to give you a good pitch to hit in these run scoring situations. Defensively behind him, the outfield is Gladden, Puckett, and Brunanski. The infield. Gaetti at third, Gagne at short, Lombardozzi at second, and Herbeck at first. With Laudner back of the plate, and Les Straker on the mound. I think one of the keys tonight for the Cardinals to get untracked is to take a strike off of Straker. As a matter of fact, he's a high ball pitcher, and his success tonight depends on whether Greg Kosk, the home plate umpire, is going to give him that high strike. Well, if he gets it tonight, uh, that's going to be a scoop because you haven't been getting in an either league the entire year. 
Uh, and one of his biggest problems, and, and you saw it, is control. He's a, he's a rookie. Eight and ten on the year, as we said. Six and three at home. Two and seven on the road. Slider, changeup, fastball. Very much like Tudor in that respect. Doesn't have a curveball like we saw Blylevin have the other night. But Tudor, while he's picked off five this year, Straker's had five box, so he can he can get a little bit, I guess, unnerved. And it, you could see that in the playoffs. Of yes. course, it's a little bit better to pitch here than it is against the Tigers with 225 home runs. If you saw game two, you saw Lee Wire, a National League umpire. He went around the edge of the plate and really unearthed the black edge, what we call the, the black. And the reason he said he did that is because he has a wide strike zone. Greg Cost apparently doesn't have that. Coleman to lead off with a bunt that will bounce. Fielded by Herbeck. No, he doesn't tag him to the disbelief of the Minnesota first baseman, but now they're going to get some help on the play. McSherry is going to confer with Kosk. McSherry said no, but now Kosk says yes, he's out. It sure looked like it. looked like he almost knocked him out of the base path with a tag. Well, well, a base runner also can make his own base path if he's not avoiding the tag. If Coleman went out of the baselines avoiding the tag, then he would have been called out. It appeared Herbeck touched him anyway. Yeah, it looked like what I said, or what I meant to say was that he knocked him out with a tag, meaning he tagged him so hard. Yeah. Let's Again, see if he goes out of the baselines avoiding the tag anyway, whether he tagged him or not. Well, he definitely got him, even though at first base, McSherry was screened. Even without being asked, he went to Koss for the call. And really, not much of a protest from Whitey. He knew nope. it. Smith takes a strike here and the count one and one. Another view now. Well, Coleman with 14 infield hits, excuse me, 14 bunt hits on the year, 44 infield hits. No doubt Herbeck playing up a couple of steps because you have to do that with guys like Ozzie Smith and Vince Coleman. Otherwise, they're going to bunt. You'll get to the ball and you won't be able to make that play. Smith taking low in the count two and two. Get a better angle right here as to whether Herbeck made the tag or not. Yeah, he tagged him. And it's grounded to the left side and off Gagney's glove. It went by Gaetti and then Gagney tried to backhand it. And he knew he had very little time, even had he come up with it, to get Ozzie Smith. And so Smith with a scratch single. Well, such an outstanding year for Ozzie. 335 from the left side. Much better hitter, and you won't see from this angle. Gaetti just misses, as you do, try to catch it, cut it off. Knows that's going to be an easy play. Gagney tries to short hop it. It's going to be a very tough play with Ozzie Smith's speed anyway, Tim. Yeah, if Gary doesn't make that play, Gagney certainly can't make that play. If you're thinking about the Cardinals right now, you've got to put the runners in motion right away. The Cardinals have waited back long enough. They're not, they haven't had that many opportunities, and you talk about making things happen, that old cliche. They got to do it right now. So Ozzie Smith off to his lead at first base with one out. No score in the bottom of the first inning. Smith with 43 steals during the regular year. And he's already off to his standard sized lead as the pitch is taken up and away by Tommy Herr, one and all. And that's exactly what it is. Uh, a lot of people think when they get that foot on the turf, that's a great league. Lead, that is not the case. Any good runner in the National League on an artificial turf for the American League is going to be out on that turf. Herbeck holding him on. Straker is prone to balk. He committed five during the regular year, and then one, you might recall, the almost imperceptible one in the playoffs in Detroit. And five balks in the American League is a lot of balks. It is, and I think one of the reasons that uh, the controversy in game two was Right here in the first inning, similar situation. Line drive base hit by Smith up the middle, and then Blylevin was not pausing as far as Whitey Herzog was concerned. As you see him doing a little groundwork. And what he what Whitey said was we couldn't run. He eventually went to second base on really moving Smith and a ground ball to shortstop, got him in position, but he could not run because Blylevin would not stop. Straker does pause. Smith goes, good jump, and Herb pops it up in foul ground and back out of play. 
The other thing I'm wondering, Tim, I, I noticed that when Straker goes to first base, he throws more overhanded than almost any other pitcher. Yeah, which means that it takes longer for the ball to get over there. The guys with the good move almost throw like catchers do. Ron Darling of the Mets, who throws right by the ear. You see the high leg kick. Ozzie Smith was three and a half to four steps gone when Straker delivered the ball. I would like to add one thing. The, the length of the lead at first base to, does not always determine whether the base runner has a good jump or not. Mari Wills brought that into the game, having that one-way lead. Up and away in the count, two and one. On the switch inning her. I guess if Mari were playing now on predominantly artificial surface in the National League, Mari would get well onto the turf with two with both feet, but have the one-way lead coming back to first base and take a shorter lead when he was leaning towards second base. So possibly that's what Ozzie's doing. Yes, Greg. Same thing would apply right here. One, the 1-0 one pitch Herb had a hack out with a hit and run play, and I would think they'd do it again. Two balls, one strike to count on her. One out. There he goes, and it's fouled away again. So Ozzy running wind sprints, and he'll go back to first. With the count, two balls and two strikes on Tommy Herr. Cardinals during the regular year, Coleman leading them in steals with 109, but he's been stopped in the playoffs and in the World Series. And then Ozzy at 43. They're missing Pendleton. Terry had 19, McGee had 16, and Herr had 19. So that's so much a part of their game, but the Twins have taken them out of their game by the fifth inning in each of the first two by the time the Cardinals came up in the fifth anyway. Well, only 94 home runs on the year, and 47 of those home runs with Clark and Pendleton out of the lineup are, are not going to help them tonight. Smith doesn't go, and it's grounded down to short, and Gagne goes to Lombardozzi and over to first for the double play. So he doesn't go after he went twice, and the Twins turn two. No score after one. That's a sight you'd never see at the Metrodome. <laughs> Got to come south for cooler weather, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, I always thought that when you when you played in a dome, it was a controlled environment until we went to the Metrodome. <laughs> and we saw 55,000 hysterical people. But, but then again, 10 runs and eight runs will do it. Huh. Temperature in the low to, to mid 40s. I think you've touched on something too, Jim. I think the Cardinal fans, and judging from the city walking through it last night going to dinner, I think they more or less have a wait and see attitude. It's almost like the fans themselves are back on their heels. I think you're a thousand percent right as Gaetti takes outside. We were here a couple of years ago, by contrast, after the Cardinals were in Kansas City and had won games one and two. And and the city was alive and downtown filled with banners and music and the whole thing. And, and granted, the off day was a 75 degree sparkling day as Gaetti gets a fly ball to center field. McGee gets a late start, but turns it into a routine catch. And Bernanski will be the batter. But coming in here yesterday, it was kind of a gray and drizzly day. And the, the whole day sort of uh, was a reflection of the mood in a way. Yeah, it really was. And that's what 10-1 uh, and 8-4 will do when you're on the short end, I suppose. <laughs> However, it wouldn't take much to get this town turned on. <laughs> right. We've all seen it. Bernanski takes outside ball one, one and oh. They saw it so much of the year with what, over three million people coming out to see the Cardinals. And as we talked about in the first games, 62 and 31 at the All-Star break. Great first half. And another great off-speed pitch by Tudor to make it one and one. Bernanski very unusual in the way he initiates his swing. He holds his bat almost in a very stiff fashion. His hands are almost over the plate. You, you won't see any hitter from either side hold his bat like Bernanski holds his bat to start the swing. Well, his weakness has always been really low and away and uh, you know if you go to extremes inside he has trouble and maybe it's for plate coverage two and two Mike Ward with the pitch counter one thing about Tudor if he's on he's not going to throw that many 
Oh, he was concerned, though. He was concerned about the cold weather. He said he was going to try hot stuff, analgesic bomb, maybe for the first time in his career tonight. And that's because of the, the fact he had to come back. Off to a very positive start for the Cardinals with five in a row having been retired, and that's his first strikeout. Well, the down and away changeup, and once you throw a fastball, what you do is you you establish that pitch, and then what he does when you throw the changeup, he swings at the arm. Like you said, Tim, you, the ball, it's not really the speed of the ball, it's the motion of the arm, and you swing at it, you get out on your front foot, and you get a guy way out in front of the ball. Herbeck hits it up the line, fielded by Tudor, and he gets him, and so Tudor starts by retiring the first six. After one and a half, no score in St. Louis. So how did this pennant winning manager Tom Kelly spend his off night last night in St. Louis left the hotel walked across the street went to a deli for a turkey sandwich <laughs> went back and watched television he was going to go to the racetrack he loves racing he was going to go to Fairmont Park across the river but he said nah too much hassle bottom of the second inning no score. Dan Dreesen takes a strike in the count on one Dreesen McGee and Ford in the bottom of the second. Danny is being platooned during the World Series with Jim Lindeman at first base. And as you all know, it's Jack Clark's spot. But with Clark gone, Whitey has to make do with what he's got. Dreesen drills it toward the gap in left center field, but Puckett gets a great start and makes the catch. Kirby read it perfectly, was off at the crack of the bat. He's got good speed and takes an extra base hit away from Dan Dreesen. I'll tell you, deceptive speed. Puckett, as you set out, got a marvelous jump on this ball. He wasn't going full speed, but had control speed when he made the catch. Well, considering where he started from, which was right center, and the reason he's playing over there, the double off the hefty bags and then a fly ball that that he hit real well. He was swinging the bat very well, so they shifted him around where I think he's a left field hitter. McGee, the batter, and the count one to go. It always seems to me he's been, but that ball slicing away from Puckett. Nice catch. One and one now on Willie McGee with one out of the bases empty. At control speed for an outfielder. It's, it's almost like the kickoff return team on a football team. You, you go hard for about 30 yards, and then you pick up the ball carrier. The same thing for an outfielder. You go hard at first, then pick up the ball. You have to be controlled with your hands because you have to catch the ball before it hits the ground. That's the object. It's not being too simplistic, is it? <laughs> Two one to McGee is over for a strike. <laughs> yeah, the heat is on tonight in the in the Cardinal dugout. In more ways than one, the heat is on for the Cardinals. It's softly to left field, and that will drop in in front of Gladden for a base hit. So Willie McGee is now four for eight in the World Series. And it will bring up Kurt Ford. Talked about Tudor's changeup. Here's Les Strikers, and you can see how Willie McGee is fooled. Good pitch, bad result. But again, if you are not a line drive hitter like Willie McGee, and this is why this park is so perfect for him, you try to pull that ball, you get out on your front foot. He just kind of went with it. Not a good swing, but good result. Now Kurt Ford at the plate. Ford. Two for three thus far in the series. He was in the starting lineup in game two. Pure left-handed batter. And we say pure because the Cardinals have so many switch hitters, and Ford comes out of that same mold. Quick, speedy, line drive type hitter, but a left-handed batter only. Give you an idea of what kind of pitching park this is. The all-time record for home runs in this ballpark was set this year by Jack Clark at 17, I believe. So not a whole lot of home runs, even though Clark did miss 31 games. Pitching out, but McGee not going in the count 2-0. Jack Clark with 
35 home runs this year. Only one other Cardinal since this park was built back and finished, actually, back in 1966. Only one other Cardinal has 30 or more home runs. That was Dick Allen back in 1970. Intimidating ballpark. Rip to center field, but right at Puckett who makes the catch, and McGee can't go anywhere. So Ford hits a shot after McGee softly singles, and there are two down in the second inning, and Jose Oquindo comes to the plate. Uh, it's funny how hitting is. Jim mentioned that Willie McGee hit a good pitch with a good result. He hit it poorly. Kurt Ford just the opposite. A 2-0 fastball. He hits a rocket to center, but there's Kirby Puckett. So Ford is back on the bench, talking it over with Tom Pagnazzi, and here is Okendo with two out and another pitch out, and again, the Twins pitch out and McGee not going. If you watch the playoffs, you, you heard so much about the Giants pitching out, taking the Cardinals out of the running game. A, a pitch out is only effective if you do it right. Willie McGee saw right there that Les Straker was pitching out. He broke, saw that it wasn't a normal windup, went back to first base. So what you do is you put Okendo in a good hitting position. It's 1-0. and Straker has to come to him. You've got to pitch out, and you have to work on it in spring training. There he goes, and there was no pitch, though. Time had been called. Time had been called, and a balk was called, which was the reason that Kosk had his hand in the air. And we mentioned Straker, five walks, which is the equivalent of about 10 in the National League, the and way they're called. You, and you got to go back to Whitey Herzog. Maybe he implanted in the umpire's mind not only Burt Blylevin, but that Les Straker. I'm sure Whitey did his homework tonight. The only pitcher who had more box in the American League was Charlie Huff with the Texas Rangers. He had nine. And clearly, Straker didn't come to a stop, but neither did Blylevin the other night. So maybe Herzog in talking to the umpires. See, that's not, that's uh, stopping about like Blylevin did the other night. Actually, a little longer. Maybe? Yes. Maybe? Got to come to a full second stop. Now, he didn't do that, but not too many pitchers do that. I don't want to disagree with you, but I said you had to come to a second stop, and a guy wrote me and said the rule book says you have to come to a pause. It doesn't have to be a second. Apparently, right. it just has you have to stop. Right. He really stopped a lot longer than Flylevin did, but then again, in a close game, you're going to have more box call. Eight to one, let's play the game. Well, a pause and a second. Well, I, that's about the same. I got the letter. You didn't. <laughs> Two out, one and oh, the count on Okendo now. The pitch a strike, and it was Kaiser calling the balk at second base. And before the game, we showed you on tape Herzog going over the balk rule. And Whitey, we were in his office before the game, and he was he had the rule book out, and he's reading it. And he says, what does this say? What does this say? Why don't they call it? Two and one. He says a complete stop. What does a complete stop mean? Interpretation of the umpire. Exactly. So what was... Well, you know, when you have an off day, sometimes your eyesight gets a better. Better. That's what happened with Kenny Kaiser. What's the balk the other night? Or what? What wasn't a balk? Is a balk tonight? Three and one. And also, I think an older pitcher like Lyle Levin, a more successful pitcher with 244 major league wins, is going to get the edge over a rookie pitcher, Les Straker, who was eight and ten this year. Absolutely. Much as somebody who walks a lot, a veteran with a good eye at the plate is going to get the edge on borderline right. pitches. And Okendo draws the walk. The first base open anyway. Straker could afford to be careful with Okendo because the right hand batting Pena, who had just 214 during the regular season, comes to the plate. And Dick Such, the Minnesota pitching coach, will visit the mound. Be an interesting. Uh, Scenario in the fifth game, you'll have Kaiser behind the plate and a National League umpire at third base if Y11 pitches. In other words, if if, we, if if the Cardinals win tonight, they're saying that the next rotation will be Viola tomorrow and then on Thursday, Y11. I, I think umpires are less inclined to call box once they call call the first one. I think it's almost like a slap on the hands. They're going to appease Whitey by calling the box. All right, we've called one. I think Straker can do the same thing with anybody else on base, and I don't think they're going to call another ball. Real good point. 
I guess we'll find out though. The thing is you don't know if you're pitching. So it's more prone to make you stop a little bit and, and give the Cardinal runners an advantage. Pena, two on, two out. One and no. Crowd booing. That pitch not as close as it might look from the upper deck. That's normally a pitch he's been swinging at the last two <laughs> games. Hard to tell from that angle, but the ball was just off the plate right there. It runs in a little bit. Obviously high at what about two inches inside. It's right in his zone. Two and all the count. I'll tell you the Minnesota outfield is playing Pena straight away and as hard as Straker is throwing. And with Tony really uh, when he gets a fastball the only fastball he's going to pull is the ball down and in. I think the outfield ought to be shaded toward right field because I think the chances of him hitting the right are great. Taking here two and one. Tom Kelly. Overnight superstar. That's why he didn't go to the racetrack last night. <laughs> yeah. He knows he's going to get recognized. Probably saved a few bucks too. He goes to the right side but on the ground and to Lombardozzi to Herbeck. And the Cardinals squander a threat in the second. We go to the third inning. No score. The view from the Goodyear Blimp Enterprise looking down into Bush Stadium in downtown St. Louis. The Goodyear Blimp coming up from Pompano Beach, Florida. And circling this ballpark on a very chilly night as we go to the third inning with no score Tim Laudner and going back to game two the other night it was Tim Laudner at 191 during the regular season putting the finishing touches on a Minnesota victory as McGee went back in the sixth inning and watched it sail out and that was Minnesota's eighth run en route to an 8 4 game two victory Laudner catching tonight when it looked like Sal Butera might get the start. Butera has been catching Straker for the better part of the last two months of the season. But when Kelly looked at his lineup, the bottom of the lineup, and Laudner has had a, a relatively hot bat, three for six in the series, he felt he needed him in there. So that's why Tim gets the call, one and one. And that's one thing I've never been able to understand why a pitcher prefers one particular catcher. <laughs> yeah, you right, of all people, huh? The Carver and Carlton to be buried 60 feet, six inches <laughs> apart. Huh? One and two. I just want to know on which side of you will Ann McCarver eventually go. That's all I want to know. <laughs> One and two, the count on Lotter. Lombardozzi and Straker to follow. Two and two. John Tudor only 12 decisions this year and if you follow this sport you know that he was hurt missed three months when Barry Lyons of the Mets slid into the Cardinal dugout Tudor suffered a broken leg but then came back as strong as ever at the end and Laudner rips it into center so Kelly plays the hot hand and it pays off in the third inning with the Twins first hit. And Laudner is now four for seven in the World Betty Series. Eight, and Lombardozzi comes Second to the plate. Baseman. Well, that's what uh, Tony. Is Burke keeping some charts? No doubt. Most likely where they're hitting the ball or it didn't look like a pitching chart. But when Tony Gwynn talked about John Tudor being wild high, it wasn't wild high, but he did get the ball up and Laudner just spanked it into center field. Not a good pitch with two strikes. Lombardozzi looks in the strike. 0 and 1. Rick Rennick sending down the signs from third. Another thing that Kelly's got to take into consideration here is Lombo is the number eight hitter, and the pitcher is on deck. And that's something that doesn't happen in an American League game. That's why he's not bunning. Right. Popped up in foul ground, and Pena comes over to the dugout and can't make the catch. And that's one of the problems here in St. Louis with those steep and very narrow dugout steps, even though he was coming over toward friendly territory. That has to 
come into your mind? Tony had the steps gauged correctly, but not the ball. He did kind of look down away from the ball, and the ball actually went between his glove and his chest. Well, I asked the groundskeeper why they did not put a tartan track warning track like they have around the outfield behind home plate, and he said it because of football. But there's so many artificial turf stadiums, you think they could do a zipper thing where they could protect some of their, not only some of the guys sitting on the bench like John Tudor, but some of, as we saw in 85 when Brett went right into the dugout yeah. here. If nothing else, at least to, to let you know there's a difference and you can feel it with your feet. That well, you're see, they the say that the groundskeeper said it gets slippery, and uh, you can see that, as you said, in the opening, you can see the moisture that collects under the tarp sometimes here. Paul, strike three. So Lombardozzi goes down on strikes. Tudor has his second strikeout, and Les Straker will be coming to the plate. Here it was, that play in April against the Mets, the little pop-up off Jack Clark's bat. Barry Lyons went over, and into the dugout he went. And the next thing you know, John Tudor is back in the clubhouse at the hospital and on the DL for three months. Straker now at the plate. Straker has a lot of experience with the bat in the minors, bunch foul. 0-1. The reason is Straker was signed by the Reds. He spent seven years in their minor league system, and even though most of the minor leagues went to the DH in the 70s, the Reds at that time, because of Bob Hausam, insisted that their minor league pitchers hit, because when they got up to Cincinnati, they'd have to hit. And thus, Straker did have a lot of hitting experience in the minors before he was dealt out of the Reds organization. He has not hit, though, in the majors. 0-2, as you can tell. Well, it's a good play. Fake a bunt the first time and then hit away because you know everybody's going to be coming in, but only if you can do it. <laughs> yeah, if you have some bat control. <laughs> yes. Les may have missed the bunt sign there. We'll see. Yeah, he did. He misses the sign and the ball and everything else, and down he goes. That's another thing that you don't think about. Not only is, is the bunt in order and a pitcher is not used to hitting, has to put the ball down, but getting the sign can be something different and unusual. I mean, he hasn't received the bunt sign in the major leagues either. So I think he missed it on the 0-1 count, and Rick Rennick, the third base coach, went back to it 0-2, and it's a strikeout for Tudor as third. Well, as a former pitcher, that happens a lot. You do miss the sign, so they just yell, bunt. <laughs> it's rather obvious, but everybody knows what he was going to be doing. <laughs> you know, Everybody but less on that second <laughs> pitch. Lautner at first, two down. No score here in the third. Pena blocking it. One and oh. Tomorrow night, the Twins, Tom Kelly will go with Joe Necro if they win tonight. Otherwise, it will be Frank Viola if it's 2-1. And the Cardinals definitely going with Greg Matthews. One and one. The reason that Gladden has seen Tudor before is that Danny was in the National League until this year with San Francisco. So he has faced Tudor in recent times. Line to left field for a base hit. Lodner will stop at second. And for the Twins, their second hit, and they have two on with two out, and Greg Gagne coming up. And that's four hits in the World Series for Dan Gladden. And once again, a high changeup. And uh, as we said, and as Tony Gwynn said, he's a control pitcher. You can see he's out in front of it. In other words, he did fool him a little bit, but because the ball was up, he was able to get the bat on it. The ball's down. It's most likely either a strikeout or a little ground ball. That's why control is so important to John Tudor. He just has to be down in the strike zone and on the corners. He says, if I get the ball in the middle of the plate, they're gonna, this will be a repeat of game one and two. Outside to Gagne, one and oh. Tell you, Laudner is, is off a long way at second base, and the reason he takes that big lead is because he can't run fast 
and a, a sharply hit ball to the outfield, he has to cheat somewhere. If you're Tony Pena, there could be a play on Laudner with Ozzie Smith coming behind him. He really gets off of there. And the count 2 and 0. Oh. Got a good lead there to Ozzie. Shuffling, at least making Laudner think about him. With runners in scoring position, as you can see, the Twins remarkable in the clutch in these situations. In the Detroit series and in the first two games here. There's Smith who has to move over a step or two now to try to cut down the lead. To center field and Willie McGee is right there. And the Twins raised the threat leaving two in the third. At the end of two and a half, no score in game three. From center field. Way out yonder. Bush Gardens. Yeah. Looking in toward home plate with John Tudor to come up for the Cardinals. Game three in St. Louis. Al Michaels with Jim Palmer and Tim McCarver. Twins leading two games to nothing. No score here with John Tudor to lead off in the bottom of the third. Tudor, lifetime, hitting 170, has never hit a home run. Oh and two. Well, he struck out six times and 40 times up, so he is a contact hitter for a pitcher. Seven base hits. Four for 13 in scoring position, so it looks like he concentrates a little bit better with runners on. And Tudor goes down on strikes, and with one out, Vince Coleman coming to the plate. And talking about the importance of getting the Cardinal running game going. Well, that's true. You know, I, I tend to, you know, I take that in a phase to say that, you know, if I'm locked up in a room one on one, that I'll come out on top. And I like to, you know, uh, go into every game to think that uh, it's always a challenge that I have to get on base. Uh, I feel if I do get on base four or five times, steal three or four bases, score four or five runs, then we're going to win ball games. And the man they call Vincent Van Gogh has been Vincent Van No because he hasn't been getting on in the World Series one for nine and he was certainly stymied by the Giants in terms of stealing bases in the playoffs. Well Tim and I were talking yesterday from a pitcher catcher standpoint and the difference between Coleman and a normal runner really that's something you can relate to Al is like as he grounds it to short and there's Dagny backhanding and then throwing it away. Bouncing off the auxiliary box and right back to Herbeck to one base. And to finish that thought is, is really that it's something you can relate to. It's the difference between when you travel by air going commercial or charter. You can go anytime you want to. <laughs> and Vince Coleman certainly can go anytime he wants to once he gets there. But look what he causes before he gets there. He causes the bad throw by Gagney, that in-between hop. And Coleman's on first, and you can look for him to run. So he only gets first base because the ball carried back and was always in play. There he goes. Smith takes a strike, and the throw is backed up after Vince Steele second. always contended that a hitter who puts the bat intentionally in front of the catcher is interfering with the catcher. There was no intent right there, and that of course is the judgment of the umpire. There's no intent whatsoever by Ozzie Smith but to block Loudner out of the play. It's perfectly legal, and nobody ever calls it. You never see it called, but Ozzie, no intention to bunt. He put the bat head in front of the catcher, and Loudner couldn't get out there and get a good jump to make a good throw. So Coleman at second, Vince reaching on what was scored an error by Gagne, stealing second, and the 0-1 to Smith missing one and one. And out of those 109 stolen bases, he attempted to steal third 27 times with a successful 22. So one of the few Cardinals that, not that can steal because they all can run, but will steal third base.
two and one. So the Cardinals getting a break on an error. Tom Kelly watching his club commit its first error of the World Series, only its fourth in postseason. And we mentioned when we began the World Series, the Twins outscored and out hit and out homered and the rest. But the one thing, they had the best defense in the majors this year, only 98 errors. Herbeck gathers this one in and advancing to third is Coleman. But there are two down. So Vince at third base with two gone in the third inning and Tommy Hur, who hit into a double play, comes up. And if you're wondering if he steals home, well, not this year. Two attempts, he's thrown out both times. But if you remember, when Straker was pitching against the Tigers, he balked with the runner at third base. His first postseason balk, he's balked once tonight. So maybe Coleman will give him something to think about at third base, even though he'll be working from the stretch. I think he balked in Darrell Evans with the Tigers in game three. Evans was on base at the time. And the count 1-0. Oh. We saw that graphic, Tommy Herr, 0 for 20. I guess if you're Tommy Herr, you, you're an optimist. You say, I'm due. There's an optimist. By the way, that was Lou Whitaker, not Darrell Evans, that was balked in in that Tiger game. To really reduce your chance of balking if you come to the set position like Straker's doing. 1-1. One and one. Pretty good indication of what Straker has to do to be successful. He gets behind him, and then that's the fake you worry about if you're a pitcher. And if you come to the set position, it really doesn't matter. But if you're in a wind-up position, I'll tell you what, you start yourself wanting to reach for the ball, and you can walk them much easier. Golf foul, and the count one ball and two strikes on Tommy Herr. No score. Bottom of the third. Card's got a man on in the first, but then Her hit into a double play. Had two on in the second. And Pena grounded out. And now they've got Coleman in third. Straker tough in these situations. And tough again here as Lombardozzi throws him out. They leave Coleman in third. We'll go to the fourth, the faithful fourth. No score. Two games. That's total runs in one inning in the total series. So Minnesota was seven in the fourth inning of game one and six in the fourth inning of game two to effectively end all of the office pools summarily. Puckett loops one to Tommy Hur. So Kirby is gone here in the fourth. And it will bring up Gary Gaetti, who flied out in the second inning. Well, they asked Whitey after the first two games, what do you think we should do to make this series fair? He said, take the roof off and don't let them bat in the fourth. <laughs> <laughs> the other night, Gladden's grand slam punctuated the fourth inning in game one. As Gaetti fouls it back. And then in game two, game two's fourth inning ended with an out. Gagne grounded out. And then Minnesota still went on to score six. One ball, one strike to count. Gaetti from Centralia, Illinois, and a big Cardinal fan growing up. Used to come to Bush Stadium a lot. He said last night, Tim, that he, he grew up dreaming about playing in the World Series at Bush Stadium, but in a different uniform. Uh huh. <laughs> Bat winds up near Ozzy. Two and two. Well, you just know if you're a hitter two and one, you're going to get a pretty good pitch to hit a fastball. And then what does Tudor do? Pulls the string, throws the changeup. Right there, looking fastball, gets the bat head out, all the way to shortstop. Dr. Crank. Something we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, Jim, in the Detroit Toronto game at the end of the season. 
And, you know, I think youngsters in baseball grow up throwing the curveball ahead in the count and the fastball when they're behind. And there's the fastball with the count even, and he gets it, and he fooled it. And that's what that 2-1 changeup did. It set up the fastball on the inside corner. And watch Pena, and watch the ball. And Gaetti thinks it's a ball, but it isn't. See you later. Brunanski with two out of the bases empty. Strike. You start thinking that that's the proper way to do it, but Little League pitchers can't get the breaking ball over. That's why they wait until they get ahead. Well, with that mindset, you'll find out later that it's the other way around, as you, that you should throw fastballs when you're ahead in the count, and breaking balls are off-speed stuff when you're behind, when you're behind, or, yeah, behind in the count. 2-1, two, 2-0, two, oh, a 3-1, if you can get it over. And with that idea and that mentality, then you go about trying to get it over, and that's what John Tudor's done so well. Crowd sensing the Cardinals getting out of the fourth. Waving their towels in the count one and two. Gone from hankies to towels. Yep, so, somebody called this the linen closet series. <laughs> Spun foul, and it's a ball and two strikes. Two out, base is empty. Fourth inning, identical totals. Each team, no runs, two hits, and one error. In the air to left field to Coleman. Extra, extra. Read all about it. Stop the presses. Minnesota doesn't score in the fourth. And the three and a half, nothing, nothing. Here comes uh, Jim Palmer's audition now as a pitching coach. What is Tudor doing? Well, Tudor, Tudor's throwing his change up with three fingers, as Tim talked about earlier. And it's the middle three fingers. And what he does, he just kind of, of course, he does it left-handed. He just kind of turns the ball over. Frank Viola, also left-handed, what he does, he makes a circle and holds the ball with his last three fingers. I'll do it right-handed because I'm not ambidextrous. And then he just turns the ball over. Very simple, very effective, and it's worked, it worked for Viola. And it's working for both Straker and Tudor tonight. Straker starts the bottom of the fourth with the fundamental fastball for a strike to Dan Dreesen in the count 0-1. Dreesen, McGee, and Ford, no score. In the air to left field, Dan Gladden is right there. One away. So Dreesen has flied out twice, one gone. Cardinals have been limited to two hits, a scratch single by Smith and a looping single by McGee. And up comes Willie. Well, the key to Les Straker so far is that he has gotten the first batter in each inning. Only one walk. So the things that really cost him five runs and four walks, uh, three hits in the playoffs against Detroit have not really been evident tonight. Again, a lot easier to pitch here at Bush Stadium than in Tiger Stadium against a team that uh, had 225 home runs, led the major leagues in that category for the year. One and one on Willie McGee. By the way, if you're scoring, Tony Pena was given an error on the foul pop that he couldn't handle off the bat of Lombardozzi in the third. Didn't do any damage. Lombardozzi eventually struck out, but each team with one error. Two and two. Les Straker out of Venezuela. Fascinating story. Pitched in the minor leagues for 10 years. Thought about quitting from time to time. His wife told him to just stick with it, hang in there. And at the age of 28, he's a rookie. McGee hits one deep to right and down the line into the corner and off the wall. Played perfectly by Bernanski. McGee has a double. There are almost no left-handed hitters who can handle the ball down and in. 
a slider to Willie McGee down and in. And the theory is all you have to do is drop your bat head. You really don't have to generate any bat speed to hit that pitch. And that's why it's the most dangerous pitch from a right-handed pitcher to a left-handed hitter. McGee having a good World Series is five for nine. And Kurt Ford, who lined out to center in the second inning. Ford hit it sharply, but for an out. 0-1, and, and that one bouncing into the commissioner's box. Here's that pitch to McGee. Now watch how he just drops the bat head. You need no extension to hit the ball up and in. You have to really get the bat head out in front, but not so with the ball down and in. Willie just dropped the bat head. The ball took off, and he's got a double. In the air to right field, deep. Bernanski going back all the way into the corner and into foul ground, and it's foul. Kept on hooking and goes foul. Oh, and two. Well, only three home runs on the year, but everybody talked about as you look at the ball just hooking and hooking. At the last moment, it goes foul. Ford broke his hand in June. Went on the DL all the way in August. They didn't apparently didn't the bone chip didn't wasn't evident or showed up in the X-rays. But they all talk a very little guy about 160 pounds, but he has good bat speed. He can turn on the ball inside. That looked like another high breaking ball instead of down and in. It was up and in, and he just got that extension you talked about. And the bots why the ball went foul. Stryker ahead now, 0 and 2. And the count remains nothing and two with one out, and McGee at second, no score in the bottom of the fourth inning. And down he goes on strikes. Well, that's that changeup we were talking about. It's not the circle change, but it's just a three-finger changeup that he turns over a little bit and runs away from left-handed hitters, into right-handers, away from left. Look at just run away. Very close to being a ball, but also very close to being a strike. And uh, most managers will tell you, it's close enough to call, you better swing. That's right. Okendo now looks at a strike. Keith Hernandez, who winds up at the World Series, didn't want to do it in a suit, and Tate Sizemore, longtime Cardinal and Dodger second baseman, is with him. One and one. Teddy, the rookie of the year for the Dodgers back in 1969. And hitting behind Brock here. Uh -huh. In 74, when Lou stole 118 bases to set, at that time, the record. Didn't see too many fastballs that year, did he? <laughs> no. <laughs> Got a few take signs that <laughs> yes. year, too, though, didn't he? That was 1974 when Lou broke the record, 118 stolen bases. Since surpassed, of course, by Ricky Henderson, who had 130 back in 1982. Well, that's what's so amazing about Vince Coleman, the first, time in first player in baseball history to ever steal 100 bases two years in a row, and now he does it again this year with 109 three years in a row. They always talk about how physical debilitating it is to steal bases the pounding on your body Okendo holds back and it's three and one this is a similar pattern to what we had in the second inning Okendo came to the plate McGee was at second base and they walked Okendo not intentionally but unintentionally intentionally and took their chances with Pena and got him to ground out now you got McGee at second and two down and the count three and one and he hits it in the air to center field, but a lot of room out there for Puckett, and down go the Cardinals in the fourth as they strain McGee. To the fifth we go with no score, and we'll be back with game three of the 1987 World Series after this word from your local station. Bush Stadium in St. Louis. No score. And the Twins keeping warm on this uh, chilly night or keeping the equipment warm anyway reminds me of 
When Bobby Mercer used to play with the Giants at Candlestick Park, he would take his bats to the sauna between innings to keep them warm. Well, in the hotter days in the summertime here, All-Star game been played in 1966. I've seen guys step into ice water, get so hot here. But on this uh, 20th night of October, keeping those gloves hot and, and well the Twins should because they led the majors in fielding this year. Ken Hervey, two quick strikes in the count, nothing and two, be followed by Launder and Lombard Dozy, the six, seven, and eight hitters in the Minnesota order with no score. The commissioner in his box uh, behind first, but he's very lucky we didn't take a shot of him before when he futilely attempted to field that ground ball off the bat of Willie McGee. Well, that's why he's the commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Herbeck fouling it away. John Tudor talked about the fact that you face eight right-handers in the lineup and only one lefty. So sometimes that uh, messes up your control. And again, as we said, the curveball is only two left-handers. There's one for strike three. I'm not sure if it was a strike, but Greg Koss called it that. It looked high to me, Jim. I think you're right. That is the commissioner feeling that, or failing well, to feel it. Failing <laughs> to feel it. <laughs> to feel it. Get his gloves warm, though. Yeah. And then Herbeck goes down on the next pitch, and the Twins begin the fifth inning. The victim of a fifth John Tudor strikeout as Laudner comes to the plate. Want to know the count? Line drive into the corner. And Ford will play the carom. Laudner is on his way to second, and Laudner is now 5 for 8 in the World Series after a regular season batting 191. And you'll recall the sign in Minnesota the other night, the Buck 90 fan club. Well, driving the ball away, we saw him take a ball really in the middle of the plate, homer over the center field fence. So he's the type of guy with 42 home runs in the minor leagues, 16, one more in the World Series, that can hit the ball the other way and drive it, just as you saw. He's not a guy that has to go up there and pull the ball to hit the ball out of the ballpark, which is going to make him a better hitter, and it certainly has a postseason play. Yeah, well, of course, he was one for 14 in the playoffs. Lombardozzi struck out in the third. Want to know the count. Almost all good hitters position their front shoulder to be able to hit the ball away the other way or back through the, the originator, as we used to say, back through the pitcher. Hitting is so much positioning. You see very few hitters who pull the front shoulder out of there who can hit effectively. To the left side, and Smith looked at third and winds up going to first. And from up here, perhaps Okendo a little late in getting over to third, but it appeared Ozzy would have had a shot. At I think also, if Ozzy's not a dummy. He knows Straker's coming up. Right. He also knows Laudner's in the base path. Base path. You see him come in. He always, as Tim said in the first game, he's on the move, and you can see directly between third and Ozzy is Laudner. So why take a chance? Especially when you've seen Straker try to swing the first time up. It's like trying to see somebody over a Redwood <laughs> with Laudner and Okendo. He's about six to eight inches taller than Jose. So rather than take the chance, they'll take the chance with Straker hitting him two outs. And we'll see how it turns out as Straker grounds it foul. Kamish had another shot at it. All right. They got him zeroed in tonight. I'm sure that Peter Ugaroff would say you learn from your mistakes. If you fail once, don't try it again. <laughs> <Got Ooh>. that, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> <laughs> that is not out of that last swing was not out of the Rod Carew hitting video. And the count is 0-2. Rick Rennick 
giving him the sign saying contact. Not even close. Six strikeouts for Tudor, who's been brilliant through five, and there's no score at the end of four and a half. Bush Stadium in St. Louis, Missouri. And by the way, that is the name. It, it was originally Bush Stadium, then they changed it to Bush Memorial Stadium for a while, and it's back to Bush and has been for the last two or three years. Bush Stadium. Danny Cox. Along with Jack Clark enjoying a, a lighter moment in the Cardinal dugout. You can afford to, to be laughing. They got through the fourth inning alive. And the fifth as well as the Twins went down in the top of the fifth. And now in the bottom of the fifth inning, it's Pena leading off. Pena, Tudor, and Coleman against Les Straker. The rookie with 10 years of minor league experience. And he starts Pena with a pitch high, ball one. Now you talk about diligence, Les Straker, not only with 10 years of minor league experience, but he played in a different city every year in the minor leagues. That's this right. is his 11th different city. Knee surgery back in 83, was going to make the club in 86 and hurt his hip, which uh, at the end of spring training. Rib injury also and did not, had to spend another year in the minor leagues. So for, to have him here and Remember, he's only averaged about five and a third innings per start for the entire season. Actually, he did repeat one year. He was in Waterbury two years, 81 and 83. So this is his 10th different city. And he had a complete year every year. Tom, Tom Kelly with Dick Such, the pitching coach. Such is a guy who knows a lot about minor league pitching as well as Pena takes up high and draws the walk. So Tony is on, and now John Tudor comes up, and the Cardinals, for the first time tonight, get the leadoff man on. In game one, the Cardinals just once got the leadoff man on, and in game two, just twice. So in the 23rd inning of the World Series, it's only the fourth time that St. Louis has gotten the leadoff man on. And obviously more meaningful in this game because of the other games, 8-1 to one deficit at one point in the second game, 10-1 to one in the other one. Tudor lays down the bunt foul. I mean, this is Cardinal baseball, and as we've said all along, if, if their pitching keeps them in the game, then they can utilize one of their offensive abilities, which is to run. Here it's going to be a bunt, but then you have Coleman up. If he, probably a better hitter. Yeah, not only a bunt, but you can't bunt the ball down the third baseline. Gaetti closing in. Herbeck holding the runner at first. 0 oh and 2. That's why Tudor elected initially to bunt the ball down the first baseline to make Herbeck feel the ball. But that's a much more difficult bunt. You've really got to extend your hands to bunt the ball down the first baseline. There's Herbeck holding Pena close. Coleman is on deck, and Tudor bunts foul, and is he angry with himself? So he can't do the job. And that's as much emotion as you'll see on the field from John Tudor. High breaking ball. As Timmy said, he's trying to bunt the ball down the first baseline, and what you have to do is bunt the ball out in front of home plate. Had the bat behind home plate. One is able to do it, and you can see his disgust. Boy, I tell you, he is normally the wow. most implacable of Cardinals. Even when he gets lit up and he's on the mound, if he'll give up a, a grand slam home run, you won't see a reaction like that from him. They're angry because he couldn't get the man over, throw to first base. When he gets angry, though, he really gets angry. Uh, you'll recall in the seventh game in 85 in Kansas City when he got lit up and came out of the game is when he had that little tussle with the electric fan in the dugout which required a couple of stitches that night. Pena called time to smooth out the dirt. One out. Coleman old for two tonight.
Pena doesn't need his glasses to work his way around the base pass. Excellent speed for a catcher. One of the reasons that uh, Whitey Herzog wanted Tony Pena. Number one, he can throw. He's had a lifetime batting average around 280, but also he is a catcher you don't have to pinch run for. That's right. So with a 24 man roster, you're not wasting a player sometimes because you have a slow footed catcher. No offense, Tim, even though I know you led the National League in triples. Right here in this park, ballpark. Well, it wasn't recently. We'll put it that way. <laughs> well, they, uh, they it was definitely 66. Pinch, yeah, yeah, definitely it was, pinch run for you now, but I mean, <laughs> how about back then? <laughs> they, they pinch a lot of things for me now. But Pena did have six stolen bases and seven tries and holds the Pittsburgh Pirate record for stolen bases by a catcher with 12. Not a lot, but... John Wathen, as a matter of fact, the Kansas City Royals manager, who's in the ballpark tonight, holds the major league record for stolen bases by a catcher. And Coleman goes down on strikes. So Straker, after getting Tudor, picks up another strikeout, and that's number four for him. Two down. Well, Les talked about his problem that in the playoffs he was trying to be too fine, but he is perfect right there, right on the corner. Good fastball, as we told you, 91 miles per hour, and he has two other pitches. So two down, Ozzie Smith now. Smith is one for two, a soft scratch single in the first, and again, we talked about the top of that cardinal order, the top three, and they are a collective one for seven tonight. Pena goes, and Smith wraps it foul, 0-1. Tell you, right before the pitch, you saw Tim Loudner looking over to the dugout, he's doing it again to see if they wanted him to pitch out, and Pena, sure enough, was running on that first pitch. Of course, if you watch the National League Championship Series, you saw giant catchers, Bob Brindley and Bob Melvin, do that quite often. Roger Craig calling a bunch of pitch outs. Pena doesn't go. Smith hits a high fly ball foul and out of play. And it's quickly nothing in two. It's a good time to pitch out right now because it's kind of a free pitch. It's 0-2, two, two outs, and if the runner isn't running, then you've lost nothing. And Ozzie hits it weakly on the ground a second, and Lombardozzi throws him out. And the Cardinals finish in the fifth, into five, no score. And so we go to the sixth inning. Al Michaels along with Jim Palmer, Tim McCarver. Game three of the World Series. No score in the top of the sixth inning. And the man with his back to you. Familiar face in St. Louis. Yep. Red, pardon me, Al. Red, yep. uh, the longest tenure as a manager with the Cardinals. Twelve years as the manager of St. Louis from 1965 to 76. Now a coach under Whitey Herzog and a guy who knows a lot about cashing postseason checks. This is, as a matter of fact, this is his ninth World Series, and he is 6-3 and three in World Series play. And the three losing positions that he was on as a player, a coach, and a manager was 1958-68 and 85. When the Braves were in it in 58, he had a three game to one lead over the Yankees. The Yankees came back to beat them. In 1968, he was the manager, played on that ball club. We were up three games to one against the Tigers, and they came back. Gladden swims it back to Tudor, and the leadoff man is gone, one down in the sixth inning. And then in 1985, Red was a coach with the Cardinals, and the Kansas City Royals came back from a 3-1 deficit. The winning share, by the way, in the World Series this year should be close to $90,000, and the losing share probably in the high 60s, close to $70,000, as Greg Gagne comes to the plate. We talked about Wayne Terwilliger, the first base coach, the other night, and Wayne Terwilliger right there in the box at first. We'll see his salary just about double with a winning share, and Tom Kelly will see his salary just about equal. Strike. Kelly signed 
The other day I asked him, I said, hey, look, don't, don't tell me what you made this year. I said, but is it close to your full salary if you win the series? He said, hey, I made $100,000. I guess, I think he would be the lowest paid manager in the big leagues in 1987. One and one. He did, though, get a raise and a new one-year deal, but just one. So he is signed through 19... 88, you would hope. <laughs> 37 years old, rookie year. What do you do for an encore? Two and one. You know, he's over there yelling encouragement. It's really the first time I've seen him yell encouragement during this series. And I guess the reason, Jim, is because the, the Twins have jumped out to such big leads that he has just set back and let things take care of themselves. Especially the first two games, the only thing he had to do after the fourth was yell, hold them. <laughs> they really put those games away. He's more animated, it, it appears, in this game than the first two. Hey, here we go, Greg! Youngest in the series. Interestingly, Sparky Anderson was a rookie manager in 1970 when he took the Reds in against Baltimore. And Gagne walks, so Greg goes to first base with one away here in the sixth inning. And Kirby Puckett. First walk for John Tudor, and goes back to what I, he mentioned earlier in the game, that his arm may stiffen. He went to the analgesic bomb, and here we are in the sixth inning. And the one difference I've seen in his stats, it's not a whole lot. He averaged three walks a game. He said his walks were a little bit up from the last two years. Gagne at first base does a little bit of running. Six steals during the regular season. He was also caught six times. As we said, Tudor with an excellent move. Last year, 11 pickoffs. This year, five. So you don't get a good jump. I guess that tells the story right there. Might get a jump, but it's not going to be a good one. So if you're caught in between as a manager and you're reluctant to run against a pitcher and a catcher combination, the alternative, if you want to put the runner in motion, is the hit and run. Puckett, a contact hitter. And interestingly, Tudor has been pitching Kirby inside. We'll see where they go this time. They're still going inside. You can see Pena try to sneak inside with that left foot to get the inside target. Post. Gagne getting back. You wonder if Puckett saw Pena as the throw went to first base move inside. So they changed it. Yeah, changed the pattern. The one thing you do not want to do as a catcher is set up too early because hitters will peak. One and the count. Each team, no runs, three hits, and one error. We're in the sixth inning. One out. Gagne at first base. Of course, there are remedies for that. Oh, oh yes. yes. <laughs> I once told a hitter, and I can't believe I said it, that if he kept, because Dempsey, Rick Dempsey came out and said, he's, he's looking back where I'm moving. And I said, if you do, so I walked off the mound and said, if you do it again, I'm going to hit you in the side of the head. And I didn't mean it. But I'll tell you what, he took the next pitch right down the middle for strike three. So I guess it worked. We, we were told as catchers in the minor leagues coming up, if you think a hitter is peeking back there, talk to him and tell him you know that. And if you let him know, I know exactly what you're saying, because if you let him know you know that, that should be enough. I know you know, and you better know right. I know you know. That's right. <laughs> I know. Great little mind game. Talk about outthinking yourself. <laughs> Two and zero the count. And three and zero. So all of a sudden, Tudor with perfect control walks Gagne and goes three and zero. 
on Puckett. Well, we talked about it a little bit about it the other night is when you have a big lead every pitch doesn't meet the ball game that is that is not the case here tonight a nothing nothing ball game and I think that's why we saw the frustration not on the Whitey's face even though he's not real happy the way things are going because they're, they're not getting any offense but when you're a pitcher and you don't bunt a guy over and you know you should have or you're wild if you look at the pitching coach Mike Rourke trying to figure out if John's arm may, might be tightening. I'll tell you if I'm Tom Kelly I let Kirby hit with the count three and oh I think John Tudor is going to be very deliberate with his fastball. Those three old fastballs right down the middle. And he loses them so Puckett goes to first base. The Twins have runners at first and second with one out and Gary Gaetti coming up. Third baseman, Gary Gaetti. Gaetti is 0 for 2 tonight, but 4 for 10 in the World Series. And he's had a big postseason. He was the MVP in the playoffs. Tudor has all of a sudden lost the strike zone and the count is one and oh. Well, it really looks like he's dropped his arm. And when you get underneath the ball, you, you lose your changeup, you lose your breaking ball, and you lose control of the fastball. You saw the ball he threw real high when you dropped down. That's the one thing in there. And now it looks like he's trying to aim the ball. And Gaetti hit 31 home runs this year, 34 last year. So it's not a guy that you can make bad pitches to. We saw what happened in the second game. Cox hung a slider and he drilled it in the left field seats for a solo home run. And he pops it up in foul territory. Pena coming all the way to the lip of the dugout and he makes the catch. And it's still in play, so down to third alertly goes Gagney. But what a catch by Pena. And you're really taking your life into your hands when you go to the edge of the dugout at Bush Stadium. Just ask George Brett from two years ago. Unless, of course, it's your dugout because you know you have some allies over there who are going to catch you once you make the catch. And that's what happened. Tony's teammates, but really a, a superb play by Gagne taking nothing for granted, tagging up and moving to third base. We'll see how important a play that is. With Brunanski hitting now. That is just a, a great, great play. And you yes. can see what Pena still went into the dugout, even with the help, and knew exactly where the steps were. One and the count. And again, those steps here are, are so steep with Gagne at third and Puckett at first. They're steep and they're very narrow. If you have a about a size 10 foot, you've got to sidestep it. Again, 1 and 0. Oh. You look fastball, takes a little bit off, ball sinks down and away, and you swing right over it. Again, Bernanski, home run power, 32 on the year. Not to be taken lightly. 2 and 1. Strange as it may seem, the crowd now comes alive. That is, I mean, the Cardinals are looking for anything, and they're unable to generate it offensively. That play by Pena might be just the, the type of thing this club needs. They need anything to pick them up a little bit. Assuming they get out of this inning. Two and two. And they're as alive as they have been at Bush Stadium tonight. And moving to third is Puckett. So they break Brunanski's back, does Tudor, and he comes through with a base hit to make it one to nothing. 
Well, a lot of people would think that would be lucky hitting, but if Brunanski's not protecting the outside part of the plate, he doesn't get the end of the bat on that ball. He is so strong, and he is helped by the right fielder, Kurt Ford, playing deep. A light-hitting hitter wouldn't get a hit like that because the right fielder would be in. But with Brunanski, you've got to respect his power, and he drops one in front of Ford. Herbeck now takes inside. One to know. One nothing Minnesota with two out and two on in the sixth inning. One and one. I wonder if you'll see Bernanski in motion now and see if Tom Kelly and the Twins can't pick up a cheap run. If Pena throws through, Puck, it'll go. He goes, and Herbeck fouls it back. So Bernanski goes back to first with Puck at third. One nothing Minnesota, two out in the sixth. You know, it didn't appear that Ozzie Smith was even covering on that play. Brunanski got a tremendous jump. There he goes again, and it's grounded to the left side, and Smith has to backtrack, throw, and get him. Ozzy that time was going towards second, and only Smith can go back that quickly and make it look routine. one nothing Twins. We mentioned when Brunanski run on the, ran on the pitch before that Smith wasn't covering, and Ozzie was playing the wait and see game. Had he not played that game, that ball is into left field and the Twins are leading two to nothing with the inning still alive. So a fine, fine play by Ozzie Smith. And as you said, Al, only he can go towards second two steps and come back forward and make a play like that. And it saves a run. Minnesota still taking the lead one to nothing as we go to the bottom of the sixth inning. It'll be Herr, Dreesen, and McGee, the three, four, and five hitters. Straker, meanwhile, has done all that Tom Kelly can ask because now he's to the point, is Kelly, where he can go to his bullpen, where he's got Schatzeter and Berenguer to set up Reardon if need be. One to know the count. And in the bullpen, Baron Gare and Shatsen, as if on cue. Straker, well rested, but he's to the point right now where he might be too well rested. Another strike, Straker over the past three weeks had faced about 20 batters. But also one of the unusual things he does, when he has good games, he writes things on his gloves. Now when he has bad games, he doesn't do that. He said, why do it? He said, I don't want to, I'll remember it, but I don't want to read about it. <laughs> Send himself a lot of messages tonight. <laughs> Meanwhile, lowest batting average. Take a look at this. Marv Owen, Dal Maxfield, now the Cardinal general manager, 115. Tommy Hur, those with at least 40 at-bats all time. Doubt that was a, a former Cardinal, hit 140. 2 1 pitch is 3 and 1. And Ozzie Smith is close to being on that list and might have been on it had he not gone 1 for 3 thus far tonight. So it shows you that the Cardinals are having a lot of problems generating anything offensively, not only tonight, but in the 85 World Series as well. And some of them even had problems in the 82, though they did beat Milwaukee. Strike 3 and 2. I get the feeling when I watch Tommy Hur in a career year back in 1985, hit over 300 for the only time in his career, struggled last year. He needs to know what kind of pitches 
and have, be familiar with, the, with an opposing pitcher. And I think when he gets into World Series, he has a lot of doubt. He, he swings at more bad pitches. He's not as selective. And that's one of the reasons for the bad batting of it. Because when you watch him play in the National League where he knows a lot of the pitchers, it just looks like he only exclusively swings at strikes. He's a lot like Keith Hernandez, who visited us in the booth. As a matter of fact, had his 31st. 34th birthday. Wish it was his 31st today. When you see Keith Hernandez hit, he does not swing a lot of bad pitches. Normally during the season, her the same. World Series has been a lot different. Three and two. Perfect example right here. Will he swing at a ball? And he rips it into center field for a base hit. <laughs> Cardinals for the second inning in a row get the leadoff man on. They threaten tonight. They've stranded five. And they get the leadoff man on with Dan Dreesen coming to the plate. Well, 3 2, you know you're going to get a good pitch, and he does. Down. Tim talked about how it's an easier pitch where all you have to do is drop the bat, and that's what he did. Hit it right back up the middle where it was pitched. In there, off speed, strike on one. Dan Dreesen at home at the start of the regular season. Cardinals called him and sent him to Louisville. Then they called him up prior to the cutoff date. And as it turns out, with the injury to Clark, he was a godsend for them. Chase didn't count as 0-2. Really, for the second time in three years that the Cardinals have had to go someplace to get a first baseman to replace Jack Clark. You remember Cesar Cedeno in 1985 having that remarkable September. And Whitey Herzog says won it for the Cardinals. Inside, just missing, just off the plate. So Straker keeping it in on him in the count, one and two. Her at first, held by Herbeck. Tommy goes, and Dreesen taps it slowly to Gagney. And over to Herbeck for the out. So the Cardinals at least able to stay out of the force. And a slight chance of a double play. The ball hit very slowly, but they are able to get the tying run to second, and McGee is the batter. Willie with a single and a double, and he's five for nine in the World Series. Tommy Herr has the best percentage of stolen bases on the Cardinal Ball Club. He did last year, too, and that's why he took off. And it's hit toward the middle, but Gagney is there and throws him out, and Herr has to stay at second. So with Herr, the runner at second, right, Gagney over, over toward the bag. And able to plug up the middle and take care of McGee, two down. Well, so much of pitching is defense, not making the plays, which Gagne does here, as much as sometimes where you play, right up the middle. That's where McGee hits the ball. Only 11 home runs, right around 286 on the year, but he's hit the ball three times hard, two for base hits, and the third time they played him perfectly. Ford, 0 for 2. Her at second. Two down in the sixth. One and all. Well, the first time he threw him a fastball, and he lined out the center right on the nose. Next time, he got him on a changeup. So let's see what he pitches him for a strike three right on the outside corner. Two and all. Fly ball to center to puck it. And the Cardinals waste yet another opportunity. We'll go to the seventh. One nothing twins in game three. We'll be back after this from your local station. Goodyear blimp piloted by Dick Esch tonight. High above Bush Stadium in 
St. Louis, downtown St. Louis, not far from the Mississippi River. This, uh, in some quarters, known as, as we mentioned, the Linen Closet Series, the M&M Series for Missouri and Minnesota, and the Mississippi River Series. one nothing Minnesota, seventh inning, and Laudner swings and misses the count on one. Laudner, Lombard, Dozy, and Straker, and, and Tim Laudner, one of the silent ones during the regular year, a big force thus far in postseason, especially here in the World Series, now five for eight, a single and a double tonight. He had only one hit in the ALCS, but it was a big one. 0-2 oh, the count. Game-winning double. Actually, he got credit for the game-winning RBI on Jack Morris in game two of the ALCS. He has just had a terrific postseason. So much satisfaction when you can catch winners, too. And down he goes on strikes on three pitches and questions that ball by Greg Koss. Pitch doesn't always have to be a strike. Again, we said the ball looks inside, but Pena's sitting there, gave him the target there. And sometimes you fool the umpire. And you can see Tim just say, I, that, 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 it wasn't a strike. Most likely saying, well, emphatically saying, I want that pitch when I'm catching. Lombardozzi now takes outside, ball one. Now, with Straker due up, there's Gene Larkin out on deck. So Kelly got exactly what he wanted. He got six innings, and he figures that's it. I'm going to go to my bullpen. Fouled away in the count one and one. So he's got, there is Straker, and he's got Baron Gare with the jacket on, who has finished warming up on his way back to the dugout. And he knows he has Reardon to close, and he knows he has Schatzeter if he's got to get a left-handed hitter out. Two and one. There is Juan Baron Gare who will come in in the bottom of the seventh inning. Out of play. Two and two. Tomorrow night, game four. And again, it will be Joe Negro pitching for Minnesota if they win tonight. Otherwise, Frank Viola. And it will be Greg Matthews definitely on the mound for St. Louis. Eight Eastern time for game four tomorrow. 2-2, Two -two, missing for ball three. And Todd Worrell is up and throwing in the Cardinal bullpen. Tudor is due to hit third when the Cardinals bat in the bottom of the seventh inning. So Whitey has to look ahead. McGee, easy play. Two gone here in the seventh inning. And now Gene Larkin. The Columbia University graduate. Funny thing, Larkin and John Morris, the reserve outfielder for the St. Louis Cardinals, both kids on Long Island, and knew each other. They, they've known each other since they were about eight or nine years old. And here they are in the World Series. Gene, a natural right-handed hitter, switch hitter. As you look at John Morris, what says he has more power from the left side? Unusual. He said he doesn't understand why, but just drives the ball better that way. Want to know the count? Two and zero. Oh. And of course, uh, hitting Larkin's bio forever will be the fact that not only that he went to Columbia, but the Iron Horse, Lou Gehrig, went to Columbia. 
Larkin breaking almost all of the Iron Horse's records at Columbia. Ground ball corralled by Okendo, and that's that. So Tuda does a real nice job, but he is still in arrears. one nothing Twins, bottom of the seven. Your attention, please. Let's get the lowdown on Juan Berenguer from the Milwaukee Brewers, Paul Molitor. For the it's no secret Juan's best pitch is his fastball. He likes to just get out there and rear back and fire. It makes it a little disconcerting for the hitter because he's not sure where it's going all the time. He likes to get you with two strikes and get you to chase that high fastball out of the strike zone or throw that split-fingered pitch which bounces in the dirt but the hitters have a tendency to chase. When you get runners on base against Juan, they have a chance to run because he doesn't worry about people on base. He's concerned with getting that hitter out. And he has a man on base as Jose Okendo wraps the first pitch into center field for a base hit. So the tying run is on. Pena comes to the plate. And Pendleton comes out on deck. Remember, Pendleton can only hit left-handed. And with the righty in there now, Baron Gare. It's Pendleton who comes out on deck. And I would suspect Shatsuter would be getting up in the bullpen. The Twins were stirring, but no action. One thing about Shaxeter, if they bring him in, then Pendleton can't hit. But for right now, it's Baron Gare and Pena up there to bunt. Strike. 0-1. Tony really giving himself up much, much too early. When a hitter, when a pitcher does this, it's one thing. You can kind of understand it. But Tony, an experienced hitter, and by giving yourself up too early, you give the first baseman, Herbick, a chance to break and Gaetti a chance to break. Too early. Pena showing butt all the way and missing. And quickly it's 0-2. And, and Nick Lago will have to send a new sign out now. There's Pendleton with Worrell in the bullpen. It will be Todd in the eighth. one nothing Minnesota with Okendo at first base and nobody out. Juan Baron Gare the Panamanian picking up for the Venezuelan striker and trying to send the Cardinals south. <laughs> oh and two. Really can't say enough about the job Les Straker did tonight. Tom Kelly got six innings of shutout ball from him. And had you told him that that would be the case before the game started, he would have said to book it. I'll <laughs> yeah. take it. Little looper down the line and a foul ball. Just foul. Well, that was that fork ball that Paul Molitor was talking about, but up in the strike zone, which uh, didn't allow Penny to hit it hard, but to make contact. You see him fooled a little bit out on his front foot. It's just a matter of whether the ball is fair or foul, and it falls foul. And if that baby's a fair ball and rattling around in the bullpen, pretty good chance O'Kendo would have scored. He was close to third when it dropped foul. O'Kendo, good speed, but not a good base stealer. Only four on the year. 0-2 oh, and a throw to first base. Again, Baron Gare's strength is his wildness. You just don't know where to look for the ball. He can be up, he can be down and away. He's got the slider, he's got the fork ball that drops and dips. Hit into right field for a base hit, and Okendo will stop at second. <laughs> a bunt he had brought Pendleton back initially or Perry had gone into the dugout but now he will come up and back and speaking of bunts it was the lack of the bunt that allowed Pena to hit with two strikes and now he turns it to a base hit well, with a one run lead you'll always take the out and what turns out the situation where they'll give you the out they don't get it and now you have the Winning run at first, tie run at second. This is an interesting choice here by Herzog. If he wanted to bunt here, 
he wouldn't waste Pendleton, you wouldn't think, in this situation. He'd go to somebody else on the bench and save Terry. And Terry had gone back into the dugout just for a moment, conferred with Whitey, and then Whitey decides to send him up here in the seventh inning. We'll see how the Twins play it also, whether Gaetti will charge. It's called a rotation play. The first baseman and third baseman charge. The shortstop goes to third, and the second baseman goes to first base. They appear to be playing it straight up. They're not sure he's bunting or not. And he squared the bunt and takes low. Remember, another thing about Pendleton, too, and he's going to go down and have a chat with Leva. He's got the pulled rib muscles left side. He can swing left-handed. He can't swing right-handed. And I asked him about running, and he said it hurts, and it particularly hurts when he starts to run. So he's slower than, obviously, he would normally be, and he's a pretty quick man if he's healthy. Okendo at second. Pena at first. 2-0. Oh. There is the tying run, and there is the go-ahead run. And there's a man talking to himself. He lays it down. It is a beauty. But he gets the runners over. It was that close. What makes this play so tough for Gaetti is that Baron Garrett just, just stands on the mound. He comes in. This is how you win a gold glove. You make a good throw. Looks like it had him by about a quarter of a step. Very close. Excellent bunt. So Herzog is able to advance the runners on Pendleton's bunt and Vince Coleman now, who's drawn a blank. He's 0 for 3 and 1 for 11 in the series. Infield up at first and third, back at short and second, 0 and 1. During the regular season, 300 from this side and 268 from the right side. So a much better hitter. See Tony Pena saying, well, calm down, get a good pitch to hit. And that's why Coleman had his best year, a career year this year. Another strike at the knees. Coleman thought it was below when it's only two. I'll tell you, if you're the Minnesota outfielders, Kirby Puckett, of course, plays a very deep center field. Brunanski in right field too deep. You've got to make Vince Coleman hit the ball over your head. Especially from the left side. He has no punch from the left side. Ripped foul, still 0-2. I don't know if you'll agree, Tim, but the key here is to get him to swing at a ball. It's something we talked about the other night. Preferably a ball upstairs. Or so in the dirt. Can, yeah, or in the dirt. Of course, with one out, you get another look. John McCherry with the out call that Pendleton obviously doesn't agree with. All he needs is a fly ball. He had only won the whole season. He grounds it fair for a base hit. Okendo scores. Pena scores. The Cardinals lead 2-1. to one. Stadium sometimes is a billiards table, especially when you slice the ball over the third base bag. You don't see it from this particular perspective, but you will right here. Down and in, playing percentage First baseball. Down. Gaetti's is over in the hole. Double. And if somebody doesn't touch it or doesn't get caught there, it's going to be a triple. Ozzy Smith with Coleman going.
third time they have stolen. He has stolen third base this year. You can kind of understand Coleman's reasoning right here. You've got the Twins on the run. It's really the first time that the Cardinals have had the lead in this series. Actually, the second time the Cardinals have had the lead. And had it early in game one. They right. thought the squeeze might be on and pitched out one and one. Infield playing in. When you get a team like the Twins, you're going to try to utilize all your weapons and with one out, a good chance to steal third because now you can score on something other than a hit. Base hit. 3-1 Cardinals. St. Louis. Dan Schatzeter now pitching with Tommy Herr at the plate. One out. Ozzie Smith at first. 3-1 Cardinals in the seventh inning. Schatzeter steps back and throws the first base, which he was prone to do. Swing. One and oh. Not a normal move as her is a much better hitter from the right side, but when Baron Gare is not pitching well, you have to do something. You set up a double play. Or apt to get a double play from her from the right side. But. That's grounded to Gaetti. Nice pickup and then drop by Lombard Dozy. But he stays on the bag, a good recovery. Thinking two, all of a sudden he was able to keep his foot on the bag and corral the ball for the force. And Ozzie Smith slides too soon. He's trying to get out of the way of the expected throw by Lombardozzi. And had he kept going, he's on second base. But because the ball was hit so sharply, Gaetti got rid of the ball in a hurry. Lombardozzi was able to drop the ball, pick it up, and get the force. Now Dreesen in the count one and oh. Her at first base, two down. Danny on a check swing, grounds it into the Minnesota dugout. One and one. So Baron Gare gets lit up. Schatzeter, who was up, remember it was Schatzeter and Baron Gare loosening in the pen in the sixth. When Kelly was thinking ahead, he opts for Baron Gare, and then Juan gives up the singles to Okendo and Pena, and then Schatzeter gets up. And remember, if Schatzeter had come in to face Pendleton, Pendleton could not have hit because he can only bat left-handed, so Whitey would have been forced to make another move. He would have lost Pendleton and had somebody else come in. And then the other thing Schatzeter could have done is faced a Coleman and Smith batting from their weaker sides. But I am sure that Tom Kelly, after the type of year that Baron Garrett had pitching in four out of the five games, even though Schatzer had his best really pitching performances in the playoffs. Four and a third innings, only two or three hits with five strikeouts. Ground ball to Lombardozzi, and that's that. But the Cardinals score three on four hits, and at the end of seven, 3-1 St. Louis. Don Worrell is coming into pitch for the St. Louis Cardinals. The inside pitch on Worrell from Tony Gwynn. Uh, Todd Worrell, when he comes in, he's not concerned about runners on base. 
He's just concerned about getting the hitter out, and he's going to come at you with his best stuff, his fastball. I think he's an intimidating type of reliever. He's 6'5", 220, 230, and he's going to come at you with his best pitch. And if he's on, good luck, because you, you might not hit him. As the Kansas City Royals found out almost a two years ago to the night when he struck out six in a row, Jim Lindemann takes over at first base. He's going to hit in the nine spot, and Worrell hits in the four spot. Dreesen comes out of the game. Dreesen made the last out in the seventh. So the Cardinals now very much alive, asking for breath, down one to nothing and two games to nothing, with Worrell facing Gladden here in the eighth inning. One and oh. <laughs> He's everywhere. Dan Deardorff, no doubt, in a seat given to him. And his wife, <laughs> Debbie, our Monday Night Football colleague. One and one. And a former Cardinal himself. The Gridbergs, though, the other Cardinals. So the first two pitches, 97 on the first one for a ball, and takes a little bit off and gets it over at 95. Nice position to be in. Catch it if you can. Yeah. Exactly. Well, he does have a slider, and as we talked about on Sunday night when he came in to really not to mop up, but just to get a, an inning's work, threw a great change up in the playoffs to strike out Will Clark. So you throw that once in a while, you get the hitter looking for it, and then you buzz it by at 97. One ball, two strikes on Gladden. Gagne on deck, and then Puckett. One away. And a perfect uh, ball club to, to pitch against. Very aggressive swinging club. The Twins, one and two. You get ahead. You hit the glove at 95, 96 miles per hour. Hitter just can't catch up. Just a little bit out of the strike zone. You see that ball very well. One to know the count on Gagney, who is 0 for 2 tonight. And he is 1 for 11 now in the series. 3 1 St. Louis, one out, bases empty in the top of the eighth inning. It is Tudor's game to win. John went seven innings, pitched beautifully, as he did in the sixth game of the playoffs against the Giants. And he's the beneficiary of those three runs in the seventh. Morell seeking the save. Two and one. Pocket next. Three and one the count. Gagney taking two and oh. He'll be taking three and one too. I would suspect. He ought to be. Yes. <laughs> Next guy on deck, Kirby Puckett with 28 home runs. Hasn't shown power in the playoffs or the series, but can drive the ball and can hit it out. Yeah. Surprising he's swinging, but. I'm glad know. I gave the qualifier, yeah. I would suspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and as we said in game two, that's one of the things that's changed in the game. And in my estimation, it's changed for the worse. Well, Gagne, one for 11, even though he walked the last time up, you'd think that. If you've been around, he really hasn't been around that long. He'd take him without even getting a sign. 3 2 to him. A little looper. Tommy Herr going out with Lindemann, and Herr makes the catch. Tommy slightly misgaged it, but still was able to reach down and make the catch. And that was a fair ball. The ball looked like it was drifting foul, but Tommy at the last minute. Makes the stab. I think he had an idea about maybe Lindemann catching the ball. Now, Lindemann tails off of the ball, and had that ball been in there, Tommy could have kicked it over near the bullpen, and Gagney could have ended up on third base. Mm -hmm. Two down, bases empty, Kirby Puckett, the batter. And he's getting a little serenade, Kirby, Kirby strike. The Cardinal fans, if you recall what they did in the National League Championship Series with Leonard, the Jeffrey, Jeffrey. I suspect that Jeff Reardon <laughs> may get that same sort of response when he comes in. 
hit to right field, Ford on the run, and he can't cut the ball off. And Puckett is at least to second. Kirby is on his way to third, and he's in there. So Ford not only can't catch it, he can't cut it off. And the Twins have a man at third with two down. Well, Tony Gwynn said he can be intimidating, he can be overpowering, and he was to the first two hitters. Then he tries a slider, and Bucket just pokes, pokes it into right. Kurt Ford knows how quick Puckett is, tries to cut it off, and instead of a double, it really turns out to be a triple. You can afford to try to make a play like that with two outs as opposed with nobody out or one out. And also with a 3-1 lead. Yeah. Gaetti now silent tonight, but a big postseason for him. I asked Tony Oliva, the batting instructor, I said, why is Gaetti a hit more home runs? He's always hit in the 20 range with the exception of one year, but the last two, 30. And he said because when he came up, he was a good fastball hitter. Now he's become a better breaking ball hitter. Fastball fouled away, and it's 0-1. I'll tell you, Jim, right before that pitch, Tony Pena looked to the dugout and asked if he should move Okendo over toward the line. Now, Okendo, normally a shortstop or middle infielder, moved over toward the line, but I don't agree with that. Not with Warrell pitching and Guy Eddie hitting. He's not going to pull the ball down the line unless the ball's down. So what you're doing, in effect, is you're giving up a run. And Nick Leva is moving Okendo almost right on the line. What's and he Lindemann doing? Lindemann also. He is moving him where he's most likely not apt to hit the ball. That's that right. doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Rip right at him. How about that? Genius. Well, we're unbelievably dumb. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> I accept. Give that man a Harvard PhD. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cardinals in Major League Baseball. Are right there. On the copy of the official World Series program. It's the perfect souvenir of your visit. Going to the bottom of the eighth inning, St. Louis on top by a score of 3-1 to one as they try to work their way back in to the series, otherwise the the alternative is 0-3, and nobody's ever come back from that deficit. Right now they lead 3-1, McGee facing Chancellor in the bottom of the eighth inning. 2-0 the count, it's McGee, Ford, and Okendo, and then when the Twins come up in the ninth inning, it's Brunanski, Herbeck, and Wagner. The Twins are at the five, six, and seven spots. Two and one on Willie McGee. Tom Kelly. Looking on as his club with three outs to go, trails by two in the count three and one. Swinging late, and it's three and two. See McGee shaking that wrist. It's still bothering him. And has through all the postseason, but he is still five for ten in the World Series. And he goes down on strikes. So Willie McGee is gone, and Kurt Ford will be the hitter. I'll tell you, you look back on that top of the eighth inning, and with Guy Eddy the hitter, the, the chances of him pulling a ball down the line are slim. And he pulls the ball right down the line, right where they had put Okendo. Ford tries to drag his way on successfully. And here comes Okendo. Well, smart play, left-hander versus left-hander. He doesn't face that many left-handers. He knows he can't probably hit them. Has great speed. He's in the game because he's a better outfielder with a three-to-one lead. Why do you want some in there? 
and some sensible baseball, and you're seeing Cardinal baseball. We've seen that the last three innings. Funny that Okendo, but I mean, Whitey is already referred to as a genius to begin with. And then those are the, the, the little things that so few people ever see. And that makes him a genius with a capital G. One and the count. Or at least it turns out that way in that instance. Yep. Well, it does. That's exactly percentage, right. Percentage, you know, really what happens when you play down the line and you got a guy throwing 98 miles per hour, even though Gaetti, we saw him hit a couple of home runs in the playoffs right, right. field, you're playing a guy out of position, but it worked out fine that time. Four it goes and it's fouled away in the count one and one. You're actually playing the exception instead of the rule and the exception happened. Which makes it exceptional. <laughs> yes, it does. It certainly does. <laughs> Speaking of exceptional, the man, Stan Musial. Could hit a little bit. Oh, yeah. A little bit. A little <laughs> bit. You saw him live, and then if you'd like to see him in bronze, you just walk out on the street beyond center field. Statue of Stan. Fly ball to shallow right center and an easy play for Lombardozzi. So two gone and it will bring up Tony Pena and we tell you that this telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Al Michaels along with Jim Palmer and Tim McCarver game three of the World Series with the Cardinals having come from behind with three in the seventh, leading Minnesota three to one after the Twins had won games one and two. Two out, bottom of the eighth inning, four to first, going. The pitch is a strike. The throw is in time to get it. So Gagney puts the tag on. Ford is gone, and so are the Cardinals in the eighth inning. So it'll be Brunanski, Herbeck, and Laudner in the ninth, St. Louis three, Minnesota one. Todd Worrell, and you can do a lot of things with him, as you know. Occasionally, he has been moved to right field when Ken Daly was brought in from the bullpen to face one left-handed batter. And what you have here in the ninth inning with Daly throwing in the bullpen is the right-hand batting Brunanski, then the left-hand batting Herbeck, then the right-hand batting Laudner coming up one, two, three. Bernanski is one for three, strike. Then, if somebody were to get on, you've got Lombard Dozy, a right-handed batter, and on the bench, of course, he has, among others, the left-hand batting Randy Bush. So a lot of things going on here in the ninth. Oh, and two. Morell trying to make it all moot. What, what isn't moot is the intriguing situation now that's come up with, for Tom Kelly. He's gone with a setup man in two ball games Sunday and tonight, Juan Baron Guerre, and he's pitched ineffectively. So if you're looking down the road, what's it going to do to his pitcher selection over the next couple of games? All heat so far, and the count is 0 2. Aaron Gare pitching four out of five times in the playoffs and then two out of the last three days and he has not been effective. Could have some more elbow problems. Have had the flexor problems with his forearm all summer. Nick Leva, Mike Ward. As they back him off and the count is one and two. Great setup pitch for the low and away slider. Yeah. And you can throw it. That's where Pena is setting. Fastball away, two and two. Obviously, if Warrell gets Brunanski out, or well Warrell will most certainly pitch to Herbeck. But if he walks Brunanski, or if Tom gets a base hit, then you may see Daly to pitch to Herbeck. To center field, McGee circles it and makes the catch. So one away, Willie McGee 
chasing down Bernanski's drive, and now Herbeck the batter. And with him having gotten Bernanski, Worrell will face Herbeck. He still has Daly in the pen. Again, if the Twins get something going, it could be that Randy Bush could come off the bench. He would be their prime left-handed hitter. They also have the switch hitting Smalley and the right-hand batting Baylor. One and oh. talk about the fundamentals it was the Cardinals lack of fundamentals Tony Pena not being able to get the bunt down that led to the three run seven had he get had, had he gotten the bunt down then he doesn't get the base hit and Pendleton doesn't bunt Smith to Lindemann You don't really know how that inning would have gone, but the fact that Tony didn't get the bunt down, he did get the base at the right field to open things up for the Cardinals. So two down, and now Randy Bush will bat for Laudner, despite the hot Laudner bat. And he is five for nine. What Kelly needs here is not a home run, he just needs a base runner. And so he's got a better chance with Bush, the left-handed batter, to get on and then he'll worry about Lombardozzi's spot next. So Randy Bush, who had a key two-run double in the fourth inning in game two, coming up. Smith conferring with Kaiser. I would imagine that if Randy Bush does get on, we'll see Don Baylor hit regardless. It doesn't really matter who's in there. Two out of the bases empty in the ninth. One and oh. We were, we were talking earlier, Tim, about how quiet this town was yesterday and the lack of the anticipation we saw in 85 but a victory will turn it into the St. Louis that we've all known for years. Oh certainly. One and one. Broken back foul ball. And so the Twins are down to their last strike. Smalley has come out on deck to pinch it if the Twins can keep it going. Big plays tonight, the way Tudor picks. Pena, Tim talking about missing the butt and the base hit. Also, Pena's play at the lip of the dugout, even though a run did subsequently score, the type of emotional charge that the Cardinals needed. To right field, Ford is there. Cards win it. Is it 
least temporarily derailed. The Cardinals won it by a score of 3-1. to Twins still leading the series two games to one. In a moment, Reggie Jackson with Whitey Herzog and Vince Coleman.